Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. The term noir has been around in crime fiction as long as time immemorial, and in the past 40 years, different authors have defined different generations, none more colorfully than Elmore Leonard, Hunter S. Thompson, and our legendary guest today, Lawrence Block. Winner of countless Anthony, Edgar, and Seamus Awards, whether you're a fan of his Gentleman Burglar, Bertie Rodenbar series, or you found your favorite of his one-of-a-kind characters and recovering alcoholic P.I. Matthew Scudder, or more recently, lovable hitman John Keller, his iconic catalog runs from the late 50s through present day, and we're so excited to have him here to explore it all. Mr. Block, thank you so much for taking out time to be with us. You're one of the true master literary storytellers. Did you find yourself making up your own as a kid? No, nothing of the sort. I had... Uh, a certain amount of facility with with writing. It came easily, generally. I did not start out with stories to tell or an urge to tell them. I realized because of a, an idle remark that a, a teacher of mine in the 11th grade wrote on a English composition, I realized that writing was something I could do and could enjoy doing. So I knew then that I wanted to be a writer. As for what I wanted to write or how I would go about writing it, I didn't have a clue. That's, that took me some years to find out. For all the success that you found writing under your own name, Lawrence Block, along the way, you wrote under a lot of pen names, prolifically, I might add. Sheldon Lord, Andrew Shaw, Don Holliday, Leslie Evans, among others. I have to imagine that was great training from writing from any angle or direction you wanted to on the page. Oh, absolutely. It was an excellent apprenticeship. And it's fresh in my mind because I just, like two days ago, uh, finished uh, a memoir of my beginnings as a writer uh, from about, oh, the late 50s when I started writing up until probably about 10 years later in early 1966 is when I wrapped it up. And I believe the title I'm going to bring it out under is A Writer Prepares. And it's much about, uh, about those books and those years. Uh, I wrote a great many of them. Um, a fellow I know has just this past year brought out a, a bibliography of my work. His name is Terry Zoback. And the book is entitled A Trawl Among the Shelves. In fact, I think I have it here. Yeah. There it is. Um, and uh, I, uh, I don't know how many books uh, I did write back then, although uh, <laughs> Terry's book would, would tell me if I wanted to check. Um, and it was very, very good training. Uh, the books were erratic for their time. Sex was certainly the major topic of interest to the characters and presumably to the readers. Descriptions were circumspect. Uh, and it's, it's uh, in fact, some of the books that, that I wrote um, nowadays are more, would more properly be characterized as romances, mm -hmm. oddly. Um, and are less erotic um, in nature than, uh, than erotic romance fiction is uh, today. Uh, but it was marvelous training because as long as uh, I was writing in English and having a, uh, a sex scene of one sort or another in every chapter, I could do whatever I wanted. And I learned how to write. Uh, I, I already knew to a certain degree, but I, I learned how to sustain a narrative for uh, uh, the length of a novel. And it, it was so it was very, very good training. 
And for the longest time, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with those early books. I wouldn't sign them if somebody brought them up to me at, a, at an appearance. I would refuse to confirm or deny authorship and, and so on. And that changed over time. Until now, I've republished just about everything and uh, even had uh, a batch of them in audio. Um, now, whether this indicates that my own standards are slipping or that I'm uh, more uh, driven by uh, ego and avarice than I might prefer to think, uh, I, I don't know, but, um, but they're all part of the body of work. I, I was, uh, I was moved along in that direction by the example of, uh, my friend, Bob Silverberg, the science fiction writer who wrote more of the, uh, sex books than I did and who was never troubled to conceal what his pen names were and what books he read. And I thought, you know, I think he's right. So as, as a result, I, I don't disown anything. The only problem in my case is that I, I, uh, I used a batch of ghostwriters so that the names are not necessarily limited to my work. And I'm willing to be damned for something that I wrote, but I, I don't really want to be, want to go to hell for something somebody else wrote. Evan Tanner's pedigree is a fascinating one, an ex-soldier with insomnia who becomes a professional thief. When you first began working on The Thief Who Couldn't Sleep way back in 1966, did you know early on you wanted to turn this into a series that followed with early bestsellers in your career like The Cancelled Check, Tanner's Twelve Swingers, Two for Tanner, Tanner's Tiger, Tanner's Virgin, and me Tanner, you Jane. I didn't know it was going to be a series as a book, yeah. Which, which as I said, is, is just about always the case um, for me. Um, no, it was a book and uh, this is very much fresh in my mind because uh, a writer prepares ends with the writing of the first Tanner book. Um, and that felt to me like a, a line of demarcation in that that was the first book I could point to and say that uh, that it was uniquely mine. I don't mean that the others were imitative, but they were uh, certainly uh, derivative, uh, if albeit unconsciously, uh, and they were, um, Tanner was a character I don't think anybody else could have come up with. Um, and, uh, and it just, it was great fun writing the first book. And with that, in that course of that book, I realized by the time I was, oh, maybe two thirds through with it, that I was going to write, want to write more about, uh, Evan Tanner. And fortunately I got the chance. My agent, uh, sold it right away to Knox Berger at gold medal and um, the, <clears throat> there was a sequel to the book uh, on his desk uh, a matter of months later, and it was published and so on. Was it fun to pick him up 28 years later in Tanner on Ice after so many years away from that character? It was, uh, it was strange. Uh, what happened, the, uh, I, <clears throat> I wrote, I guess, seven books between 1966 and 1970, you know. I wrote a, a couple books a year. And after Me, Tanner, You, Jane, which was the seventh book, I realized I was done. Uh, the books had a, I had a feeling I was imitating myself. I, 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 it, and, and it was an easy series to stop writing uh, as far as, uh, <clears throat> as far as the rest of the world was concerned, because Tanner had never built that much of a following. There were, uh, it, the book sold enough copies so that the publishers were willing to bring them out, but uh, nothing ever went into a second printing. You know? And uh, 
So it was kind of a dead end in that respect. And it felt like wheel spinning in, in other respects. So it was easy to let go of Tanner. And I would occasionally think of him over the years and think it was a shame because I really did enjoy those books while I was writing them. And then in, uh, in 1997 or whenever it was that the idea came to me, uh, I had occasion to think about Tanner because uh, New American Library was going to be bringing out the seven Tanner books in paperback. Hmm. And, and I thought about that and I thought, gee, it'd be nice to write another, but it's impossible. This is a guy who was, the reason he hasn't slept it, all, all these years is that uh, he got a piece of shrapnel in his hypothalamus in the course of the Korean War. You know, so let's let's be clear on this. He's a little too old to be having the kind of adventures he had. And unless he has, you know, I don't want to write about an elderly Evan Tanner. That, that wouldn't work. And then I got the idea of his having been frozen all the years in, in all the intervening years. And that seemed to work so well for Tanner, you know. Um, the, uh, the idea that someone who's never slept has suddenly spent, uh, you know, 28 years in a coma. There, there's, there was a poetic balance to that. So I wrote uh, Tanner on Ice. And I was pleased with the way it turned out. And the great mystery of it all, where do character names tend to come to you from? I won't be able to answer it. I, I don't know how I name my characters. And the names just sort of work out. As you're getting to know them, when do they first start talking to you, before the reader ever gets to meet them? I don't know exactly how it, uh, how it works, but um, sometimes when there are characters who work very well together and who have uh, extensive conversations that way, that's often, um, I'll, I'll often imagine conversations that may not have anything to do with the book or that may ultimately resolve in the book. That's true, for example, with, uh, with uh, <clears throat> in the Bernie Rodenbar series with Bernie and Carolyn. Um, and it's uh, that those are the major uh, ones where uh, the conversation is so easy to get caught up in that um, I have to be aware of the danger of letting it run away with the things. Really? Well, sure. It's very easy for Bernie and Carolyn to talk in a presumably amusing fashion for, for a whole book without anything happening. And that wouldn't really work too well. Let's introduce viewers to Bernie Rodenbar, the gentleman burglar, who we first meet in Burglars Can't Be Choosers, where he winds up with a dead body in the next room as he's pulling a job. Where did you originally get hit with the idea that he goes solving all these murders while committing his burglaries? It was, uh, it was at a low point in my life when I was uh, down and out in LA and having great trouble getting anything written or selling anything that I wrote. And I'd done nothing but write for uh, a living for years, um, quite a few of them. And so I had no real job experience and nothing much else to, uh, to do. And, I, and a sufficient lack of self-esteem so that when I would look at an ad in the newspaper and it would say, man wanted to sweep up after the horses, I would think, well, that's, that's something I could do. And then it would say, experience required. And I would think, well, there's no point even applying for that because they'd take one look at me and I'd say, get out of here, you son of a bitch. You never swept up after a horse in your life. You know, so I, I didn't even look for jobs. And I was trying to think what I could do. And a still small voice said, don't rule out crime. 
And I thought, uh, what? And as it, as I said, yeah, you know, I'm not a criminal. I have an unblemished record. I, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, besides, I, I, I could get caught, you know. <laughs> and the voice said, if they catch you, they have to feed you, you know. Problems like paying the rent will cease to uh, apply. And I tried to think what I could do uh, of a criminal nature. I didn't want to do anything that would have violence on either side of it. And I thought that burglary might make a certain kind of sense, that a whole point of burglary was to avoid human contact. And I thought it wasn't that different from writing. You set your own hours, you work alone. Um, and I played this out as fantasy. I don't know that it would ever have led, led it anywhere, but then again, I don't know how desperate I might have gotten. But I thought to myself, well, suppose, you know, I were committing a burglary and I were arrested, police broke in. I thought, well, you know, I just go quietly and I, Right, realistically, with with my past history, I would probably get uh, probation or or something of the sort, um, and so it wouldn't be that awful. And then uh, I thought, well, suppose I was all prepared to go quietly, and they found a, a dead body in the next room. And I thought, well, that would be a problem. And instantly I thought, well, that would be a book. And that's how I, st I sat down and started writing Burglars Can't Be Choosers. And indeed it was a book. Um, and I finished it and my agent placed it with Random House. And I never did have to break in anywhere. So in a sense, as, I, as I've said, uh, Bernie can be said to have saved me from a life of crime. Wow, talk about life nearly imitating art. The Burglar in the Closet is one of my favorite books of yours ever. And from there, this amazing new period in your career emerged out of the late 70s and exploded into the 1980s with The Burglar Who Liked to Quote Kipling. Please tell us about the invention of those brilliant early books in this series. I did not set out to write a series. I set out to write one book and, and didn't know when I started that if I'd even be, be able to finish it, you know. Um, but then... After that, uh, I liked the character and I liked writing in that voice and uh, and it, you know, <clears throat> I, I certainly think that it's useful uh, not, if you're going to write a series not to hide from the reader the fact that it is a series. So, so with some uh, consistency in titles makes a certain kind of sense. Um, the, uh, it was interesting to me in that it, as I said, I certainly didn't have a series in mind when I started. And it took until the third book that I, before I realized, uh, what I was doing or what, what I might be doing, because that's the book and that's the burglar who liked to quote Kipling. And that's the book in which Bernie has the bookstore for the first time and as Carolyn as a best friend. And uh, those two uh, elements are really what make the series work, I think. Uh, and um, it took me a while to, to, uh, to figure them out or to find them. As the world that you built for Bernie to both rob and solve in came more to more in life in new bestsellers like The Burglar Who Studied Spinoza and The Burglar Who Painted Like Mondrian. Talk about a muse on fire. What are a few of your favorite from the collection that followed? Like The Burglar Who Traded Ted Williams, The Burglar Who Thought He Was Bogart, The Burglar in the Library, The Burglar in the Rye, The Burglar on the Prowl, and The Burglar Who Counted Spoons. You must have had so much fun with these books and titles. You know, the uh, burglar books are, in one respect, the hardest to write because they have uh, traditional mystery plots. There's a, uh, something that has to be solved. And I'm lousy at that. I don't know how to do that. 
Um, and I just write from within the central character, whatever I'm writing. And uh, so in the burglar books, typically there's a point where Bernie assembles all of the suspects and says, I suppose you're wondering why I summoned you all here. Well, I'm the one who's wondering because I, I usually at that point don't know what he's going to tell them. You know? Wow. And I've been fortunate in that um, he, he's always come up with a solution sooner or later. But um, no, I don't, I don't know that, uh, that any of the plots make particular sense or that one's better than another. I, I don't know how you figure that out. First meet the now mythic among your fans, Matthew Scudder, a down on his luck alcoholic ex-cop private investigator for the first time in the equally as story, The Sins of the Fathers. Did you like this character right off the bat enough to know that you wanted to write a series with him as the star? Scudder's series was um, conceived as a series. That's one of the rare instances for me where that was the case. And um, it was at the uh, suggestion of my agent at the time, a fellow called Henry Morrison, who said that uh, it looked to him as though a particular publisher, a paperback house called Dell, uh, would be very open to uh, a hard-boiled series of some sort, a series he said about a, a tough New York cop. He said, I, he said, why don't you see if, if that goes anywhere for you. And I thought about it. And I realized that I didn't really want to write a book uh, where the character was the member of any sort of bureaucracy. Um, when when Evan Hunter as Ed McBain wrote police procedurals, I enjoyed them immensely, but I did not aspire to writing one. Yeah, I felt that uh, I wouldn't be good at it. I felt that there was far too much crap I would have to learn in order to do that, and I didn't want to, and I didn't think I'd be good at it. So uh, I felt that a former uh, policeman would work. That, that made sense to me. And I read a book about uh, around that time um, written by uh, a New York Post reporter named Leonard Schechter uh, with uh, a fellow named William Phillips, who was a cop a good cop, but a corrupt cop, and who wound up being a principal witness for the Knapp Commission investigating crime and uh, police corruption in New York. And uh, through some permutations, that, that, that book did a lot to inform the character of Matthew Scudder. And the decade that follows, readers grow with Scudder through his own character evolutions and In the Midst of Death, Time to Murder and Create, and other great early titles. What about his character held your interest over those next few books that followed? I wrote a serious proposal, I remember. This was in late 1973, I think. Wow. I wrote a serious proposal about Matthew Scudder, a few, um, several pages. And then I wrote the three books, one right after the other, uh, The Sins of the Fathers, Time to Murder and Create, and In the Midst of Death. And um, and Dell <clears throat> bought them, was very pleased with them, but it took a while for them to come out because Dell was having a lot of, uh, of problems themselves at the time. But the books eventually came out and didn't sell well they sold well while, where they were distributed, but they weren't distributed well, so they didn't develop much. And then uh, somehow I found myself still interested in Scudder. 
Well, it's quite a good thing for fans that you did because you went on quite a prolific run after that with 8 million ways to die when the sacred gin mill closes, out on the cutting edge, a dance at the slaughterhouse, a walk among the tombstones, the devil knows you're dead, a long line of dead men, everybody wicked and everybody dies. How did you decide that you'd age scudder throughout all these decades of writing them? There was no commercial reason for me to remain interested in him because it was unlikely that any other publisher would want to take over a series that one publisher had already gotten nowhere with. But I wrote a couple of no novelettes for, uh, that I placed in Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine. And then uh, one day, a couple of years later, was I think in, must, must have been about seven years after I wrote, six or seven years after I wrote the first three books, I wrote uh, a fourth novel about Scudder and uh, the series has proceeded onward at an erratic pace, but uh, never entirely putting itself out of business uh, all those years since. So when I started writing about him in 73, 74, I didn't expect him to age or change. Um, typically, a series uh, characters in, in, in crime fiction didn't. Um, especially private eyes who were generally functioned as uh, a window through which a story was told. Uh, Chandler toward the end started having changes happen in Philip Marlowe's life, but uh, Chandler's own life was sufficiently screwed up by then so that I don't know how much it, uh, significance should be attached to that. But basically, a character stayed unchanged. And I figured uh, Scudder, for as long as I wrote about him, would lead the same life and stay the same unspecified age, which was probably late 30s, something like that. Um, but um, And <clears throat> other characters I've written stay the same age. Bernie Rodenbauer. Uh, hasn't aged perceptively, nor has anybody in this world, nor has he changed. Um, a Keller's life has gone through changes and he's probably older than he was as his life has changed, but not, not perceptively. And, uh, uh, but with, with Scudder, a, a strange thing happened and it was apparent to me when I was writing um, the fourth book, A Stab in the Dark, and that's that um, the books were written at a higher level of realism than other things I'd written. And it was not realistic for him not to age, for him not to change, for him not to be affected in one book by what he'd undergone in the preceding one. And so by the end of uh, A Stab in the Dark, in A Stab in the Dark, he is clearly more at the effect of his drinking than he had been in previous books. And at the end of it, he first begins to recognize that there may be a problem here. And then Eight Million Ways to Die was the uh, logical uh, follow up for that. And when I finished Eight Million Ways to Die, I thought the series was over. And this was a voice I liked to write in. This was a pair of eyes I liked to look at the world through, Scudder's. And I would have liked to do more, but I couldn't figure out how. And Eventually, uh, I wrote a short story called uh, By the Dawn's Early Light, which was uh, a flashback. It was well, not a flashback, it was set back in time and it probably took place somewhere oh, oh, during the first couple of books. And, and it was very successful. It, uh, it was it was my first sale to Playboy. Uh, it um, was uh, 
an Edgar Allan Poe Award nominee. Did it win? I think it won. Um, and uh, and it 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 was um, I was very pleased with it. And I realized that it could be a book. Now the story ran about oh seven eight thousand words I think, and I expanded it to a book called "When the Sacred Gin Mill Closes," which was over eighty thousand words. So it was not simply stretching a short story out. It, uh, a couple other subplots became incorporated in it, and it, it was a book I was very, very pleased with. But that didn't mean the series could go on. You know, you can't have this guy remembering something every book. Right. Um, we've run into guys like that and we don't want to hang out with them too much. Uh, and then a couple of years passed and I, I don't know why this was the case, but there was one night when I was thinking about it and I realized that I could go on writing about Scudder. There was room for a new novel. And uh, so I wrote a seventh book. And then there have been stretches since then where I would write a book every year or so about Scudder. And there have also been stretches of long stretches of time with, without anything. I mean, uh, there was a point along the way where I realized I'd been aging Scudder in real time. And I even got specific about his age finally in a book called The Long Line of Dead Men because the book was all about, oh, aging and mortality and the passage of time. And not to be specific about it, it his age in that book would be, uh, wrong. So uh, I had to pick an age for him and I'd never done that before. And I decided the simplest thing was to make him the same age I was, which he'd probably been all along essentially. And also that way I would have uh, a lot less trouble keeping track. Um, so, uh, so actually I think he's a few months older or younger, whatever. I think I think it's somewhere specified what his date of birth is, though I don't recall it. Writing the antagonist that Scudder's faced off with throughout his career, take James Leo Motley in A Ticket to the Boneyard as a great example. How deep down do you have to dig to tap into that kind of evil? And any advice for aspiring fiction authors on that particular art? It doesn't... Uh... It doesn't change my mood during the day. I mean, it's, 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 it's not that kind of uh, affect like a, a method actor and playing a, a difficult part. No, um, I think, I think what's required, I think there are two things that are required uh, in, uh, in getting villains right and presenting them in the round. Uh, one is that as the writer, I have to have the courage to find within myself the elements that resonate with that character. Um, there's not a lot of courage required in writing for all that the metaphor of artistic courage and that I, that's what we're, <clears throat> we're, we're sitting at computers. We're not uh, jumping out of airplanes or, or <clears throat> facing saber tooth tigers. This is uh, a, a pretty low risk occupation. Um, but uh, to the extent that courage is required, I think it's the, the courage to go to places within oneself that one might not otherwise choose to visit. Um, and uh, there have been a, a, a batch of uh, characters and situations where that's been a re requirement. Um, I remember 
oh, back in, I think, 1987 or 8, I wrote a book called uh, Random Walk. And one of the characters in there, one of the principal characters, is a guy who's going around the country, killing women and enjoying himself immensely. And um, that required getting into a, a head that one would probably prefer not to occupy too much. Um, but it, uh, it didn't disturb me unduly, I don't think. But it did require as, as much courage as, uh, as, write, as is ever demanded of a writer. By the start of the millennium, you've been writing Scudder for 25 years, and his case cracking continued with new bestsellers like Hope to Die, All the Flowers Are Dying, A Drop of the Hard Stuff, and most recently in 2019 with a new novella, Time to Scatter Stones. What does an author do to keep a series intriguing for them when it stretches over 40 years like this one? This was a voice I like to write in. I think I'm pretty certain that I'm done um, writing about him. The most recent entry was a novella, about 30,000 word novella, um, called uh, A Time to Scatter Stones. And I like that and I'm, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad I wrote it, but I, I can't imagine uh, anything, any continuation. I think probably uh, that, uh, when the sacred gin mill closes was was maybe playing in a tougher league than some of the other books. I, I, I like that uh, a lot. And I often suggest that as a, a first book for people to read in the series if they want to see what they think. After writing him for so many years, how did you feel about Liam Neeson's incarnation of Scudder in A Walk Among the Tombstones a few years back? It, it wasn't, you know, I just, uh, hoped it would be a good picture. And uh, with Walk Among the Tombstones, I think it was. I think, oh, Scott Frank made some uh, plot decisions early on that I think were probably a mistake. But, um, and I think he may suspect so himself. Uh, but in the main, I thought the, uh, the, the film was excellent. I, I thought Liam Neeson was artistically a, a perfect choice for Matthew Scudder. Oddly, uh, he wasn't a good choice commercially. He was in the sense that that enabled them to get the picture made, but he wasn't in that uh, the whole Taken franchise was such that uh, half of the potential audience for A Walk Among the Tombstones stayed away because they thought it would be an, it would be Taken number five. And the other half went hoping it would be and were disappointed. So it was, it was, uh, it was unfortunate that way. It killed the picture at the box office. Uh, and it's having a second life now um, through streaming and various stuff like that. And um, is, is getting far more respectful attention than, uh, than <clears throat> on the ground critics gave it when it came out. So uh, I, I think highly of the film. So my favorite character from your catalog is truly one of the most memorable and lovable hit men to ever, ever grace the page. The one and only Keller, who I incidentally met at a post office of all places when I found a copy of Hit and Run somebody had left there. Was his picture on the wall? From the first short story that appeared in Playboy and introduced viewers to Keller, did you know early on that he was going to hang around in your creative mind? The whole series essentially, except for Hit and Run, was written uh, episodically. And the, the uh, it was... Uh, you know, when I wrote the first uh, Keller story, Answers to Soldier, uh, I had no idea there would be a second. Um, I just liked uh, 
the idea of a hitman going off somewhere and um, and having a difficult time for one reason or another carrying out his assignment. And I finished the story and it was well received. I think it was nominated for an Edgar Award. I know it was, uh, it appeared uh, in Playboy. And, uh, and <clears throat> that, that was that. I, uh, I think as, as much as two years went by when I found myself just thinking about Keller. Everybody thinks about Keller after they read him, millions of us. It's really the trick, isn't it? That he befriends the reader. For you, how early on did you get to like him? I thought, you know, that was an interesting character. He's the kind of guy, kind of <clears throat> lonely New York guy who would probably wind up in therapy and what would that be like? And that led to the story, uh, <clears throat> Keller's Therapy. And I wrote another story. I was uh, invited to submit to an anthology of uh, hitman stories. And I wrote a story called uh, Keller on Horseback, I think was the title of it. Anyway, uh, one thing led to another. At the end of uh, Keller's therapy, and I certainly hadn't planned it this way, but at the end of the Keller's therapy, he had a dog that had formerly been belonged to his <laughs> dentist. And, uh, or his therapist rather. And and one thing led to another. And uh, and I figured, well, how's a hitman going to deal with having a dog? You know, he's traveling all the time. He doesn't work in the city, he goes away always. And that led to a story called Dogs Walk, Plants Watered in which uh, a young woman uh, comes into his life and walks his dog and waters his plants and house sits for him. And one thing just led to another. By, by that time, I realized that I was writing a, a novel on the installment plan. And so after I did have uh, 10 stories about Keller, um, they were a book. And it didn't require any editing for them to be a book because uh, around the, from <clears throat> around the fourth story on, I was consciously aware that what I was going to uh, do would uh, would constitute an episodic novel, and uh, and I would uh, describe all of the books as episodic novels, except for Hit and Run, which which set out to be one through story all the way. It's my favorite in the whole series, and I love them all almost equally. That Bart Simpson hat that he wears on the run is just brilliant. And in this book, we also find out that Dot's still alive, which is fantastic in Keller world because we all so love the relationship back and forth between Dot and Keller. When did you first discover Dot in your imagination and know that she was going to be an important character in this series? Oh, sure. I, I think the, uh, the rapport uh, between uh, <clears throat> Keller and Dot and the conversations that they have are... Um, are uh, a uh, uh, great fun to write, almost effortless to write, and uh, and that uh, readers uh, like that very much. No, I didn't. Uh, you know, as I said, and when I wrote the first story, I didn't expect there would be more stories. So the manner in which a relationship developed between Keller and Dot, um, it it just happened. You know. And uh, and um, uh, it was has been very enjoyable. Crossing my fingers for all the Keller fans out there, is there a chance we might get to see him on the page one more time, or is he pretty much retired now to stamp collecting and raising his daughter with his wife in New Orleans? Well, you know, I think I'm retired, <laughs> um, and. I, I think he'd have a tough time doing it much without my participation. I, uh, I've i never closed the door on uh, another Keller story, and I've occasionally um, written openings that, uh, that didn't go anywhere. Um, you know, I'm 82 years old. I've been writing since my late teens. Um, Many, many years ago, a friend of mine with a somewhat similar history, uh, Hal Dresner, the fellow whose pen name Don Holiday was, uh, he said to me, 
you know, the two of us have reached that point in time where the higher moral act is not to write the book, but to spare the tree. And um, that was a lot of years ago. So I don't have to feel that I haven't uh, slaughtered enough trees or, uh, you know, written my name in the dirt enough times. And I, uh, however, I'd, I'd be willing to write more, except I don't think, I, there, there are a couple things that uh, decline at some point. One of them is imagination. Uh, my imagination is not as keen or as creative as it once was. Another is energy. I really don't want to, I really am not able to put in the hours doing this uh, that I did. I write, when I was working on the memoir, which uh, didn't require all that much in the way of creativity, even then a thousand words was a, a very full day's work when uh, I might get that much done fairly early, but once I had, I was tired. I so I, I, I don't think I'll want to uh, do much more writing. Well, against that golden backdrop, we are all grateful for you being so open today about your entire incredible catalog. Before we go, in the spirit of an imagination that I'd argue is still shining quite brilliantly on the page, please tell us about your most recently released novel, Dead Girl Blues. In my most recent book, Dead Girl Blues, where the, uh, not only the viewpoint character, but the narrator of the book is, uh, uh, well, he's not a serial killer quite, but he looks as, he seems as though he could be. Um, and anyway, it, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very dark book and one that, um, one that gets uh, a couple of reactions. Some people say that it's one of the best things I ever wrote, which is nice to hear at an age when most people are cutting out paper dolls and being a little bit gaga. But, uh, and other people uh, hate it and couldn't finish it or didn't like it or whatever. And so it's, uh, I know I'm pleased with the way it came out. You've won two Anthony Awards for Best Novel, taking home nine Edgars, including the Grand Master Award, and over 10 Seamus Awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award, among countless others. It must feel nice to know that your singular contributions to the bookshelves are acknowledged so royally and roundly. I think they're wonderful to receive, and they don't really mean very much. I was really pleased when I got the, uh, the Diamond Dagger Award for life achievement from uh, the Crime Writers Association in the UK. Um, uh, I'd already received uh, the comparable award in the States for Mystery Writers of America, but that was in a sense almost to be expected. Um, but the, the Brits really didn't have to do this and that, that pleased me. When you look back over the literal gallery of works of art that have populated your legendary catalog, do you ever play favorites? I have to confess, Jake, that I'm unpardonably fond of every word that's ever come out of my typewriter or computer. So, I, you know, I, I like everything immoderately. After unforgettably touching readers' lives for over 60 years, many of us like myself who I hope have conveyed you that you've not only entertained but inspired me to pick up the pen among millions of others. What kind of sage words would you share with us before we go? Oh, it's always nice to hear that, uh, that someone has really enjoyed a book or felt moved by it. Most important, uh, write to please yourself. Um, that's... Uh, that's just the best advice I can give. And the other is don't expect too much. That's what I tell people who are so excited because something of theirs has just been accepted for publication or whatever, you know, don't expect too much. If, uh, if the results are great, that's nice, but 
nothing short. Mr. Block, we were not sure we were gonna to get to speak to you. It has been such a career high honor for me personally to have talked to you today in such depth about a catalog that I and so many millions of people have loved for so many generations. Thank you so much for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV. Would not have been complete without you. Sure thing, Jake.